Dean. I wanted to talk to you about your upbringing because I think that gives context for who you are now. Can you just tell me a little bit about what you were like growing up and what aspirations you might have had? Survival. Oh, wow. <laughs> Survival was, uh, I think, my main aspiration. Although at the time we didn't really know it, you know, we were, we were quite poor. Money was pretty scarce. Um, single parent household. I had or have two younger brothers and, you know, it was me and my mum really trying to get us all through, uh, through life. So, yeah, it was, it was a difficult upbringing when I look back now as an adult due to the economic situation. Mm -hmm. So aspirations beyond being a footballer were just survival. Yeah. I've heard you say before it was a happy childhood, though. Oh, yeah. It, it's only now as a parent mm. I, I look back and think, wow, that was, you know, yeah. those, were, those were difficult moments. We had moments where, you know, we didn't have electricity or we didn't have gas, but my mum would be playing games and there'll be, you know, games in the house in the dark. So mm. it was all just like wow. seemed fun and games to us at the yeah. time. So we, I, I enjoyed myself. But yeah, looking back now, you realise how Mm. how hard it really was. Oh, but I think it really gives context to you as a person now and the kind of career you've had. I want to start by going through some interesting stats. So obviously I spent some time looking at your work history and I know that you tried the football thing, didn't work out, went I think initially to a call centre, didn't right. enjoy it obviously. And then you went to Primavera which was an enterprise management software company um, which you helped grow and it ended up being sold to Oracle for 500 million. I think I'm right in saying you actually had shares in that company, is that right? Yeah, yeah, by then I did have a good, good equity position in the company. Oracle bought the company, you then got offered a, a very good salary to stay on. Then in August 2016, you went to KDS, a French company. Obviously there were some issues there with the cultural differences. And it got sold to American Express and that it was their largest tech acquisition ever. And then in March 2020, Core HR, which you were leading, was sold to Access for more than 200 million, and you stayed on there. Then in March 2022, this year, literally one after the other, you're working at Fotero, another software company that was sold for 1 billion euros. I want to know what makes you uniquely positioned to help these businesses? Because I'm assuming they're all different beasts. They're not the same, are they? No, they're, they're all. Uh... They all quite. They all were quite, um, quite different. Common thread being um, being enterprise technology, and uh, I would say that they're all like underdog brands in in some way, shape, or form. And I think I've just really enjoyed, you know, having to fight and punch and push. Um, yeah, so I, I really, I really enjoyed them. I guess other people might have found them challenging, but I really, really, really enjoyed each one of those. How, how does the process work in terms of, so you've, you've been in this call centre, mm -hmm. you then go to work for a, a company where you're leading the sales, obviously you get known for that. In terms of your first CEO, CEO role, how did you get employed? How, did, how does the hiring process work? I, I joined KDS to run what we called commercial at that time, so it was sales, marketing, all of the parts that, that uh, interact with customers, so that was the reason the reason I went there and I worked alongside a brilliant founder who was then the CEO, um, technical and engineering background. Uh, and after a few months, you know, it just became kind of clear to he and I and, and clear to the board that a different configuration, you know, might work, uh, work better. And he had some other things he was interested in pursuing. So a few months later, he moved into the chairman role and I took over as CEO. So it wasn't a classic interview mm -hmm. process. It was more yeah. This is a new configuration that might might work better for the company. It was uh, it was daunting. <laughs> in the beginning, mm, in the beginning sure. was was frightening. Yeah, and the fact that it was based in France, wasn't it? Or the headquarters was in France. How was that in terms of you're moving to a country? I don't think you even spoke French. Yeah. Did you learn French when you were there? I uh, I had lessons every week for five years and no, I, still can't you're speak, fluent. <laughs> I still can't speak French. Wow. So what was, in terms of the cultural differences, because I know that obviously with the other companies you come along and the founder's out mm -hmm. and that has its whole issues with culture and everything else in terms of company culture. When you're at KDS, what was the culture like and did it have to change, you know, change slightly when you became CEO? Yeah. I think in each of my jobs, um, Daniel, when you're taking over from a, a founder, mm. there's inevitably like a deep and strong culture that's been built by that founder and typically kind of around that founder right it's in the shape of of that founder in some way shape or form so in each of them there's been a 
a heavy degree of cultural transformation. And I think it's just part of like the generational evolution of a company, right? You, you know, you know, if a founder starts a business, it gets to a certain point, and then the company has to change to get to the next point. And in, in my career, I've been the kind of enabler of that change, right? At that moment in time, investors and founders decide the company needs, you know, a different perspective. And I show up and try to bring that bring that change. Probably hardest at KDS because of the language, because mm. of the culture. Um, so that was, you know, very, very, very uh, difficult to, to change. But again, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I like when the odds are stacked against me. Do you prefer, if you were offered two different jobs for CEO, and one was like a real challenge, and one was pretty straightforward, which one would you go for? I, I've had those offers. I, yeah. I've, um, I've been lucky in my career. I've had a handful of what I would consider to be, you know, the most prestigious jobs, working for the most prestigious companies in tech. I feel very, like, privileged that the phone has even rang for some of those um, opportunities, but it's just never interested me. It's just mm. never interested me. The, yeah. the plain, the, the perceived plain sailing nature of working in those environments just, mm. yes, never, never interested me. Yeah. I think the challenge um, for you is obviously going into a company, and I assume there's obviously possibly different issues in each company that you've worked at. Can you describe, are there any kind of commonality between the issues in each company that has required you to come in and take over? Um, Besides the obvious, which might be a failing company or not doing so well financially. I think that the common theme with each has been uh, what I call kind of religious blinding, right? So, and again, it's a generational thing. So, so by religious blinding, I mean, for a company to be good, quite often, it has to become obsessed with a small number of things. You know, even some of the best companies, tech companies we see, if you look at Salesforce, right, there was a period where Salesforce was just talking about cloud mm. computing and you couldn't hear them talk about anything else. So for a tech company, it's, it's often a symptom of success to be highly obsessed and focused on a small number of things. In each of these uh, roles I've had, I would say that obsession or that kind of religion, as I sometimes express it, has just existed for a period longer than it ought to have had, mm. right? There was a moment in time when we should have stopped being obsessed with that and start, started to be obsessed with something else. And time just moved on. Um, and then people kind of doubled down on the legacy obsession instead of moving to the new one. And that's something that you, you get to be critical of just because you're new and you're fresh and you don't have any connection to what was happening before. You just kind of walk in on day one and scratch your head and say, this, I'm not sure this makes sense anymore. You know, why are we still doing this? And you, often don't get great answers as yeah. to why we're still doing it. Mm. And then you move the company out of that generation mm. um, into the next one. It's, it's very rare, you know, very rare that I look back and say, oh, we did something just magical and spectacular and we came up with this set of game-changing, mm. you know, alchemy that changed the fortunes of this company. It's normally just saying, guys, you know, perhaps we shouldn't be doing this stuff anymore. Yeah. You know, good companies do these things, let's do let's mm. do these things. Do you do a lot of research? So obviously you've worked in particular kind of sectors within tech. Do you do do you look because I was I, I think I sent you a link the other day, but I um, listened to an interview recently with a football manager and he was saying that he took a year out once he'd left one uh, team and he went and he kind of met with other CEOs and we're talking about CEOs of businesses completely unrelated right. to football. Um, but he also went and, and met with other football teams. Do you do research? Like, do you go out and meet with other companies and just see how they run? All the time. All the time. I, I love sitting with other CEOs, mm. you know, other, other leaders, investors. I spend a lot of time. I mean, I'm not, a nat I'm not a good natural networker, so it's been an education mm. over time to force myself to do that. But I love doing it because you sit with another CEO and you hear them describe their company. And sometimes you come away thinking, oh, you know, that sounds terrible. Like, I never want to do any of those things. So it's just positive reinforcement of the negative things that you know. And sometimes yeah. you hear someone describe something and you, you leave the lunch and you think, oh, you know, I'm an idiot. Why, mm, why, why aren't I doing mm. that? And you run back to base and, and yeah. you implement that idea. So, yeah, I spend a lot of time just talking to other people and listening mm. to what they do and how they do it. So I know you're a big fan of Steve Jobs. And Tim Cook arguably had the hardest job in the world taking over from Steve. Um, 
he has answered a question once to Charlie Rose in an interview where he was asked, you know, once you have given the staff everything they need, we're talking about great salary, um, shares, you getting perks, free meals, whatever it is, what other than that do you offer com- you know, your staff that keeps them there? And he answered the question by saying it was all about culture mm-hmm. and that there was obviously a strong culture from when Steve Jobs was there. And that didn't really change once mm-hmm. Tim Cook came on board. But I know that when you join companies as CEO, often it's important that you move the culture to, in a different direction. Mm-hmm. How do you keep the DNA of a company and yet shape the culture in a slightly different route to make it more profitable? Mm-hmm. Well, part of the role of the shift in culture is to get people to vote that it's a culture, the new culture is one that they like and they want to be part of. So I, I never approach that in terms of total preservation. We're not, you know, we're not trying to get to the next level by being exactly what we were before. In order to get to the next level, we are almost certainly going to have to change and changing the culture is inevitably a big part of that. So I try to be very, very, very deliberate and clear about the elements of the previous culture that we want to keep, the elements of the previous culture that are no longer going to serve us, and what are the elements of our new culture that are going to enable um, success. And recently I've, I've stolen a frame in which to do this, which is by kind of carving up history in, in generations, right? So I talk about Fortero and 1.0 and how Fortero behaved during 1.0 and what made 1.0 special. Then I talk about 2.0 and what came into 2.0 from 1.0 and why that was really helpful and the new things that were, you know, uh, new and helpful in 2.0. And now we're in Fortero 3.0 and I talk to the team and staff about what parts of 3.0 are enabled by 1.0 and 2.0 and now these are the new things that we're going to have to do uh, in 3.0. And I'm, I'm explicit about what we did in 2.0 that we're thankful for, we're grateful for, but I never want to see again uh, mm-hmm. in 3.0. And that, that has helped me frame it for people, be respectful of the past as well, because you don't want to show up into a company and say, well, everything that happened before I arrived was terrible, because that's almost never the case, and mm-hmm. it certainly isn't the case here. But then also explain to people why you have to leave some of those things and why the new things are going to be helpful um, for all of us. So that, that, that framework has really, has really mm. helped me. And have you learned? Because obviously this, you know, you've had several exits now. And we're talking about several that added up to a billion. And then your last one. And I actually heard an interview you did. I don't think it was that long ago, maybe a year ago. And you said your next goal was to do one exit of equal value to the others, the previous, so a billion dollars, a billion euros rather. And that's what you did this year. And also the interviewer asked you, once you've done that, will you like sit back and relax? And I think I got the impression that you would consider it and you haven't. Mm. What happens the moment, so like, let's talk about your first exit. What is the feeling when that happens? And what is the day after like? Yeah, that, <laughs> that like 24 or 48 hours, is hard to describe and I've gone through it luckily kind of four times you have this amazing feeling of um, elation a a little bit different with each time because my life had Mm. changed uh, with with each but an amazing feeling of elation one part of that is about the accomplishment right because you've been pushing hard with a team for a period of time to get that done another part is um, what it means for people that have been part of that and another part is what it means for you personally so it's an amazing sense of accomplishment and you know you you just feel you feel great and then maybe not the next day but always shortly afterwards I crash I crash like pretty heavily Mm. Um, and I call it like marathon runner syndrome because you know you've been training for the 26 miles of the marathon for three four you know five months maybe and then you get through mile 26 and you feel great but you're exhausted And I don't know, a few days later, I guess you wake up and you don't have to go and do a 10 mile training run and you're a bit Mm. lost a little bit, right? And that's how I felt after every single single one of those. And at times it's been very hard to get going again. So this is why I think you're never going to stop because it's almost like a drug, obviously. But also, you know, when you hear about celebrities who go on stage and play to however many... Uh, thousands in the audience that coming off stage is a really tough moment like you were saying about 
your um, once you've sold, it's because the accomplishment, the thing that you were striving for and yeah. you strive hard, is done. Yeah. Then you're potentially sometimes moving on. You know, yeah. sometimes you stay on. When you stay on, which you've done in this case, then what is it like going back? And obviously, everyone's worked so hard. Mm -hmm. There must be a general sense of elation. What's the next step? I challenge myself this time because in, in all of the other cases, I've known I was going to move on. Mm. And this time I knew I didn't, like I intellectually didn't want to move on, but I had to get myself emotionally ready to stay because no part of the way I work is purely about intellect or economics. It's always about putting my entirety into something. So I knew I kind of emotionally had to be um, brought in and I, I really challenged myself this time to say this is just a pit stop on the real journey right this isn't where it has been in the past the end of the journey for me this is a pit stop and you have to condition yourself to mm. see this as a pit stop it's a junction you know you just have to sail through this as quickly yes it's the biggest one you've done it's the best your happiest maybe it, it's a pit stop so really being kind of challenging myself to to be in that mentality. And yeah, it's been the reason I've been able to kind of get back up and, and go again. But what is next for the company? We're in, uh, we're in free, free .o now. And the interesting thing about this company is it's technically 12 companies in a group mm. structure, you know, 12 small companies. And there's so much to share from each of those companies between each other that's gonna create value in the business. Um, there's so much to be gained by making it a singular, uh, a singular company, or more singular um, company. And there's nobody in Europe doing what we do at the scale that we can do. So it's actually an opportunity for me to create a you know, multi-billion euro pan-European category leader, which is not something I've done before. And there are brilliant numbers that are going to go with that. Right? There's fantastic mm. economics, there's a brilliant headline number that will go with that. But I'm really like, motivated and turned on by creating something that big and meaningful, you know, in, in Europe. Mm. Because I just look back in my life and I say the 18-year-old version of me had absolutely no right to even be like in this conversation. So that like that has been a source of energy and motivation and, and inspiration. I want to talk to you about your latest deal. I want to know how these deals kind of come about. What's the process? Tell me, you, you, a billion euros sounds a phenomenal amount. What does it mean to you to do those kind of deals and how do you get to them? Mm -hmm. Well, it's always part of the journey that we're kind of aiming towards a, a transaction of some, some kind. This, this one at Fortero was different because it was, as I said, kind of a, a pit stop on a, on a longer journey, right? We want to build this company into a European leader over the next you know, few years. Um, but I became aware of Fortero um, in 2020 and talking to Battery about the company and what they were trying to do with it. And I remember talking to Dave uh, Tables, who was the, the partner investor in, in Fortero, that this absolutely would be a billion euro uh, company. And he, who has tremendous experience and loved the company and saw a lot of value in the company, uh, probably thought I was like overreaching a little bit when I said that said that to him. And then I uh, arrived at Fortero and a lot of the businesses I've run, we've talked about transforming them and you know them being in trouble and having to dig them out of trouble. That wasn't the case at Fortero. It was doing very well, highly profitable and probably not growing as fast as it, it could have done. So it was a very, very good foundation, a much better foundation than I'd ever inherited um, before. So the next thing was about like planning, building a, a strong, five-year plan, um, which we did really quickly because the company was, was doing quite well. And when we built that five-year plan, we said we're going to use the next 18 months to prove that these things we want to do over the next five years, we can do them. Mm. Right? So we're going to have an 18-month intense period proving out a few elements. And after six months, those elements we, we were like focused on were doing much, much better than even we expected. So at that point, I went back to Dave and said, look, you know, we've got this five-year plan. We were thinking that we might do a transaction three or four years down the line. Actually, oh. this is going incredibly 
uh, incredibly well, and I think we should do it now. Um, and it took him a while to, to kind of come on board. I didn't think he thought it was going to happen mm. um, that quickly. And then I was really uh, insistent that it be a financial investor. So sometimes, as you know, you, you might mm. sell a business to a strategic, you know, another company that wants to own that mm. product or business. Here I wanted a financial investor so that we could keep going right. um, for the next uh, four or five years. Um, and things were just going like so well in that early period that we had a number of different offers. Uh, it's the first time I've run multiple offers right to the finish line. Normally you you take an offer, you go yeah. into exclusivity and then you close. This time we had multiple parties right until the day before we signed. I didn't even know you could do that. I would assume. <laughs> Normally in all of my other yeah. deals, you know, you, you have you have offers, mm. you pick one yeah. and then you spend two months or three months closing out. We were doing that parallel with uh, three or four parties. So it was, you know, super intense and it helped us get the price up because everybody knew that there were multiple parties involved. But it also helped us keep the price high because sometimes interested parties do what we call retrade at the end and say actually no. And because you've only been speaking to them for two months, you have no choice. But here we had two mm. or three parties all uh, at a very, very good uh, economic offer. So it was so much work, so intense because you're actually selling to three different companies mm. you know, simultaneously. Um, but yeah, I was I was adamant that it had to be a billion or, or more, and I won a bet with Dave um, on that on that basis. Was this because this was a personal goal for you? I know you obviously thought the business could do it, but that you decided that was the kind of thing you were striving for, which makes negotiations easier, I guess, because you're like it's this amount. It has or, to be. Yeah. yeah. It, I, I said to. Tim Campbell in 2020 in, a, in an interview that the next one would be, like we, we talked about that, that the next one would be a billion euros. And I said that before I knew the company Fortera existed. Wow. <laughs> and it, it just, it comes back yeah. to this strange reality bending mm. philosophy that mm. I unreasonably yeah. I have. But the thing is, because you've had success with it, because you have a distortion field, like many other leaders, it then kind of bends to where you want to go. And right. once that's happened once, you're like, well, of course it can happen again. Right. And it does keep happening for you. It's right. fantastic. Right. And I think you attract, I don't know if you attract things because you think in that way mm. or you just filter out mm. anything. Right. So I would never have had a one minute conversation with an investor about a software company that couldn't get to a billion quickly because mm. my mind was so intent yeah. on that. Mm. I think I just filtered those things out yeah, yeah. super, super quickly. Yeah, it's interesting when you look back, you can try and work out how things happened the way they did, but I think it's a combination of both those mm. things. You attract it and obviously you're good at filtering. I've heard you say before that you feel like lucky, that you feel like people have kind of almost held out a hand at certain points and helped you along the way. And I know this is something you do massively now, what, when you say people have helped you, what do you mean by that? Do you, have you had mentors and if so, how have they helped you? It's always fascinated and puzzled me that these people just like showed up at a moment in time and gave endlessly for zero return or next to zero return most more often than not. That helped me so much. I, and I, I, don't, I don't fully understand it, right? So I'm, I'm CEO at KDS. And Alex Ott is the chairman, and I hope he forgives me for saying this, but he, he takes me to dinner one day and he says to me, your compensation isn't right for the job you're in and it's not at market. And I, I can't remember the conversation exactly, but I got up from the conversation knowing I was, I was not being compensated at the right level. Now, I was a new CEO, right, and it was a great opportunity for me. I wasn't being compensated at the right level. I now know that as a chairman, it not only was not his job to do that, there's an element of he probably shouldn't have done that in mm. the way that he did it. But that conversation led to me correcting my, comp well, learning what market was mm. for people in my situation and then having it corrected. And that conversation turned into millions of pounds for me, right? And I don't know why he did that. Like it didn't make him wealthier in any way, shape or form. You fast forward to um, Access when I'm working for Chris Bain 
and I'm struggling to deal with working for somebody because I, had, I hadn't done that for a while, so I'm, I'm working for Chris. And he realizes I'm struggling to do that. And he, he, he kind of initiates this rhythm of very casual conversations that we have at the time over Zoom and then over coffee and drinks and, and a meal, where he was basically managing me and mentoring me, but he was doing it in a way that wasn't abrasive because he knew mm. I was, was um, struggling. And now at Fortero, I do so many things that reference learnings from those conversations. And again, like nothing, you know, not, nothing to gain. And I don't, I don't know how or why, but in my life, there have just been these people who have shown up, given me so much that's let me thrive, and then they, they kind of vanish. Mm. It's interesting, because I have in, interviewed a mutual connection, Dwayne Jackson, and he said almost the same thing, that certain times, when things were actually very difficult for him, someone would show up and, you know, help him along the way. And he, he often credits them. And I always think, he says he's lucky, and I've heard you say that, and I always think it's not luck. Like, you've put yourselves in positions and obviously built relationships with mm. people, and then therefore they're trusting you and you're trusting them, and you're able to have those kind of conversations. And I think um, what I was going to say about this is that you, you're... Trust with your kind of mentors, but also your board is highly important. Mm -hmm. How do you gain trust with your staff? I mean, obviously you go into companies and I, and I think it's fantastic because you obviously talk to them and you said like, you look back at what's worked and what hasn't and move forward. Mm -hmm. But how do you gain their trust other than telling them the kind of roadmap? Communication, authenticity and uh, delivery or, or proving, proving it, right? So. You know, when, when a new leader takes over, you put the team or company into a period of uncertainty because everybody, you know, everybody starts to imagine what you're going to do and sometimes people's imagination like, get, gets, uh, runs away with them. So you have to communicate. You have to you know, over, over communicate. Um, and then I, I always have this process of spending time with as many people as I can. You know, spend time with the leadership team, but then I want to go and spend time with people who what, like actually do work, they always mm. say this, not, not execs, because execs don't do much work. Like it's mm. people who talk to customers. Um, and you want to go do that so you hear what they worry about, what they like, what they don't like. You get, you get such a real perspective on the company that you don't get in the boardroom. So mm. I go do that. And then I'm really focused on doing the things that I said or we said um, we would do. And like telling people that we, remember we said we were gonna do this, mm. remember we updated you that we were doing it, we've now done it. And you do that time and time again, and hopefully you build trust. If you don't build trust, you at least build a reputation for doing what you said mm. Uh, mm. you would do. And then people start to, you know, they start to follow uh, mm. a, a little bit. Or, or people leave, which yeah. sometimes is okay too, not all the time, but sometimes. Mm. That's okay. So that's been like the only recipe for, you know, trying to get people to, to trust me is mm. saying what we're going to do, going and speaking to them about why we want to do it and getting their opinion on it, then doing it and then telling them mm. that we, we yeah. do it. Because I think obviously they trust you when they see that you do what you're going to say, which right. lots of people don't. But I'm assuming you have some influence from your board and your team and your, when you're kind of... I know you probably have the ultimate decision, but are you, have you ever been influenced to a position where you didn't agree with what the general consensus was? Is there ever a time when people have advised you and it didn't work out? Or did you go against something they said and it worked out? Has there ever been that Never. occasion? Never. Wow. Not, not on any meaningful topic. I, mm. I, would, I will, would never, have never, yeah. and will never, on a meaningful topic, mm. go with a consensus that I don't yeah. believe in. And, and there's one very simple reason for that. I, I, I don't care about my notice period. I don't care about the employment practices where I'm concerned, mm. right? where staff mm. are concerned, absolutely. And I accept that investors or board can turn up one day and say, listen, we're just, we want to go in a different direction, so it's the end mm. for you. I will only be able to live with that decision if every choice that was made, everything that was implemented, mm. I felt was the right the right thing. Mm. Can you imagine like being 
being fired because you mm. did the thing that everybody mm. said was right mm. and you knew it was wrong. Mm. I, I wouldn't be able to live with that. Yeah. I could be fired for doing the things that I think are right. Mm. I could live with that. So yeah. I would never go with consensus for the sake of it. That's good. In terms of negotiation, I, I've heard you say before that because of your upbringing, you feel like you've had nothing and you were content with that. And now, if you were to lose it again, you know, you'd be content, you know, you'd manage. And I think the most successful people can constantly, you know, reimagine their future and find a different path. If you're working for somebody else, essentially, when you're working for a company, when you're going into the negotiation deal, it's not your baby, but it is kind of thing. <laughs> what gives you the upper hand when you're going into negotiation? Because you've done some great, I understand that this last deal, it wasn't even on the cards that there was going to be one billion euros, and you're like, I think we can go a bit higher. So how how does that work? Like, how do you set what you think the company's worth? And I know a lot of it's the economics, but also how do you then go into a negotiation? I've got this unreasonable and unrealistic sense that either me or collectively we can just bend reality. <laughs> like mm. it's a, it, I don't know where it comes from. Sometimes I look at it and think to myself, you know, you're bonkers. But unfortunately for me and others, it keeps <laughs> proving itself out. I think on the, negotiate, on the negotiation point, I say it to young people nowadays as well, like my upbringing and that hardship is an advantage that few others in the boardroom that I'm up against have, mm -hmm. right? So I'm negotiating with people who who really need to buy the company or really want to buy the company or really need to, you know, invest in us or... So you're in the room with people with a different set of motivations. And I can't lose, really, because the worst that can happen to me is I end up back in the situation I grew up in, which I enjoyed and which I came through mm. successfully, right? I mean, this guy's never been in that situation. Mm. He, he should be scared. He, he has more to fear than I do because mm. if he has to go through what I went through, I don't know if he can no, come through it, right? Mm. He might not survive it. So he, he should be worried. Like, he mm. should be concerned about getting a good deal. I don't need to be concerned about getting a good deal, which is incredibly liberating because if I don't like the deal, then I won't mm. do the deal. Uh, or if I lose the deal, that I, I never want that to happen. That, that can be okay too. So mm. that upbringing... I hear a lot of young people say, you know, we can't do it because we come from here and this, that and the other. And I think you just don't understand how much of an advantage that situation actually actually is. I think how that is framed is excellent and it can inspire so many because like you said, there are people that are coming up and might not think it's possible. And I think highlighting what you do is so important. You've started a group, Forbes mm. Family Group. What is your goal with that? to um, routinely be that positive intervention that, that I had um, and that I talk about. And that, that was the thinking behind setting up, um, setting up Forbes Family Group, to, to try and create some infrastructure that could consistently be there for you know, the generations behind that are coming from similar situations uh, to, to myself. And you do a lot of mentorship. How do you get involved with that? Like, how do you pick who you're going to mentor? Yeah, it's, it's getting harder and harder because we started with Project 10. So just 10 people. And they were coming through the network, just, you know, friends and, and family. And now, as the profiles increased, I mean, we're probably getting, you know, thousands of requests a year. My thing with the 10 was meaningful impact. Like, that's so important to me to have meaningful impact. Not to stand on some pedestal and say, we've mentored, you know, 20,000 people and we don't know any of their names or if it's been helpful or not. We've probably mentored a couple hundred now. Um, I know a lot of names. I can tell you where a lot of them are in their journey. I can tell you who's really kicked on, who hasn't. But it is getting harder because, you know, we're getting more and more inbound, um, mm. inbound interest. So we're probably going to have to rethink it soon. You invest a lot of time and effort into mm. your mentors. What are you hoping they get out of it? What do you get out of it? We're looking for people that have got positive momentum or, you know, of their own, right? We want to see people who are actively trying to progress their own situation and then we want to help them kind of get to the next um, level. So part of Product 10 is that they have to come into kind of a six-week incubation program 
where they get set certain tasks, they get set certain kind of engagement things that we want to see them do. And we just want to see them routinely and regularly, you know, engage in their own individual development. And once kind of we see that and we see a spirit and an energy that we that we like, then we'll place them with a with a mentor on a paid work experience um, placement. It kind of comes from how we started it. You know, these these um, work placements were with people in my network. So if I was going to call you and say, Daniel, I've got this great young person who needs, you know, journalistic experience. Can you take them and can you pay them? I wanted to at least be able to say, no, 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 I've seen them for six mm. weeks and they're a good, positive egg. Mm. Uh, and I could say to you with confidence, you, you mm. ought to take them. It, it doesn't scale. So we are going to have to uh, rethink it. But the, you know, the kind of sentiment that you have to be already in an upward trajectory I think is going gonna, is gonna to remain no matter how we, how we shift it. Do you find that you see qualities that you had as a young aspiring CEO? Do you find those qualities in other people? And is it easy to spot, I'm assuming for you? It is. De- de- definitely. And that's, that's why I'm so passionate about the FFG work, right? Because I, I know how to see those attributes in a young person coming from a cancer state, you know, in in London, a heavy working class background, I, I really feel like I can see those attributes where sometimes, you know, corporate UK and the hiring practices that we all adopt in corporate UK, um, you know, they, they, might, they might not see them. So that's, that's why I love what Project 10 does. It kind of takes that raw talent, might sand it down a little bit so it fits a bit better in the corporate world, but also elevates it and lets people understand, actually, you are really good and you're entrepreneurial and you're really creative and you think in a way that's going to be really valuable to HSBC once you're, once you're there. So we lift them up a little bit and we kind of sand down some of the edges a little bit in a way that I don't know that some parts of corporate UK you know, are, are, ready, are ready to mm. do. I was always curious because you see a lot of kind of graduate programs at corporate companies and I always wonder you know, how they take people and how they decide. You've obviously brought people in and assuming that they're, they're good and they're turning up on time and stuff, you then set them on a path which could, you know, hopefully set them up for life. What, what do you get out of it? Because you were saying earlier about, you know, people have helped you and they had nothing to gain. Mm-hmm. But you must realise now that there is so much to gain from helping others. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I just get an incredible sense of worth and, mm. and value, right? Because, and I say it often, if... The 25 years that I've had, 20, 23, 24 years that I've had, to put me in this amazing situation, unimaginable from my early life. If that journey and all the learnings and all the contacts don't get put to helping the next set come through, then, like that, to me, that would be like a real tragedy just to kind of be sat here on my own with my immediate family enjoying mm-hmm. life. And there's another set of young people grappling, especially in mm. today's economy, mm. who are just like a phone call away or six weeks of work experience mm. away from, it would just be shameful not to, uh, not to do that. And, it, and it's why I have such a problem with our government, you know, from time to time or often, because I just see them like routinely failing at, at solving this problem. And I don't, I don't think it's that hard. I was going to ask you about that, because I, first of all, I feel like you're so good at storytelling, and I know that you consider yourself an introvert, and Dwayne Jackson said that you're more of a thinker. Like, you don't necessarily want to go out and be talking to everybody. I know you do through your work, but in terms of your personal life, you're more introverted and you're kind of observing. Now, I feel like you'd be very good in politics, and I think you've got the right idea. I mean, I can say that as somebody watching from the outside, but when I hear you say, let's not wait, let's not wait for the government to do something for us, let's, right. you know, let's make our own way, I think that is kind of your theme throughout your life, that you didn't wait. Right. Like the football thing didn't happen and that would have derailed a lot of people mm-hmm. because that was, I'm guessing, for some time, the path that right. you were taking. Then you had various things happen within your family, your immediate family, you had homelessness. These are the kind of things that knock people's confidence, but that didn't let you, it didn't stop you. Then you start working in a call center when the football career didn't work. And you, I've heard you say that you were crying, you know, the first couple of weeks because it was hell and so different to what you're used to. Where do you get the drive from? And I, I gather it's obviously from your upbringing. But what do you think that we should be doing when we see things are not happening with the government? 
Like you tweeted this morning about um, NHS staff. Mm. I mean, it pains me that we can do that. And we all clapped at eight o'clock right. and, you know, during the pandemic, and now they're left in the lurch. So how do you think you can affect politics? Or at the basic level, how can you make change? Mm. I, I've had, uh, in the last year, a lot of conversations about you know, my political aspirations. And I went through a short period of thinking that if I really wanted to see the change that I'm passionate about, that is the right vantage point from which to do it. And a few experiences close to politics in the last year have told me that I absolutely must go nowhere near that, right? Because there's a tone that exists in politics and there's bureaucracy that exists in politics that I'm not, I'm not good at and I wouldn't be effective at. And, you know, one of my worst but favourite examples of this is I had a six-month conversation with the mayor's office in London. And the start of that conversation was about kind of the post-pandemic back-to-work initiatives that the mayor's office was, was leading, which included an initiative about getting young black men in technology in London into work, right? So without being egotistical, I would like to imagine that I have something to contribute to black men in London getting into technology. <laughs> um, so we got into a conversation about how I could help. No money in it for me. There's absolutely no financial gain in it for me, but I really wanted to help. That conversation hit a dead end for two reasons. One, because I had two, two things I insisted on. One was that if the initiative was gonna be stopped due to funding, the lack of funding, that the government allow me to continue the initiative. Fund it, we would fund it, mm. right? I would fund it with a set of sponsors or myself. Uh, and number two, they allowed me the opportunity to review and advise on the initiative itself, right? So not just invite me into a pre-existing mm. initiative that I haven't been briefed on, I've just seen the headlines, let me review it and advise, and then you do what you want with the suggestions. And if you need to cut it because of budget, allow me to mm. continue it. And it took six months for the mayor's office to explain that that wasn't, uh, that wasn't a possibility. And all it turns into for me is that, well, all you want is me to stand up yeah. with you know, my, uh, my, my color and my profile and, and say loud mm. that, you know, black, black men in London should get involved in tech, but you're not really interested mm. in deeply addressing this um, issue. And I've got 10 other examples of engaging with government where it kind of follows the same path. So unfortunately, I don't think individually I can change the landscape in the UK in its entirety, but I can change you know, 50 people's mm. situation for the next three or four months. And some number of those 50 will use that help and, and kick on. And I'm much more interested in doing that than you know, being the poster child for initiatives that are gonna just die because of a budget cycle. Have they carried on with the initiative or did it just not happen? Uh, the initiative's continued. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and it, no will, it will end this month because of budget. Yeah, and no one's heard about it. It's crazy. I just think it's so lack of kind of foresight. Like they could have obviously created something absolutely fantastic and then take the glory from that, actually right. doing good work. Right. So it must be frustrating with you. I take it now you're not going to go into politics. Um, before we go on to kind of what you're doing next, I wanted to ask you about What's kind of the greatest, because you've seen leadership at all levels, like you've seen it like we're just discussing there, in terms of government, you've seen it in your, your own kind of career. What would you say are some of the greatest leadership lessons that you would like to pass on to others? As a leader, the tool that has helped me the most is um, self-awareness. Right? So I, I trained early on personality and profiles, you know, Myers-Briggs and, and those kind of things. And I think those have helped me the most because uh, I went through a period where I didn't get on with my manager and I thought the person was an idiot. I actually didn't, I didn't like the person, I thought they were an idiot. Um, so it affected, of course, the way we interacted. And then I trained on Myers-Briggs and I understood that his language and his defaults were just the opposite to mine. But it helped me talk to him in his language um, and talk to him in a way that he would engage with me in a, in a way that I wanted to. And it just put a huge light bulb on for me that, you know, there's my style and then there's everybody else's style and everybody else isn't wrong because they mm. come at things differently to me. 
so it just it just helped me to reframe what I needed, what I wanted, the feedback I was given into language with tone that might resonate better. And over time, it's helped me with communicating more effectively, which I think is the number one job of a CEO, effective mm -hmm. um, communication. So it, it's helped me with that because I always think about the 2,000 people at Fortero and that some of them are going to want numbers and some of them are going to want pictures and some of them are going to want a great story and some of them are just going to want to hear what's happening for the next week. So in this, I don't know, 20 minute presentation, we mm -hmm. need to hit all of those because um, it's my job to be understood, right? When mm -hmm. we communicate, I think it's our job to be you know, understood. So if a person doesn't understand, it means I didn't communicate uh, Absolutely. It, effectively. And I think that, that, and I don't get it right all the time at all, but that's like my starting point that if I'm communicating, it's to be not heard, but, but understood. Yeah. So, yeah. I was going to ask you about actually storytelling because obviously now you have a social media presence and one of the books that you previously recommended was First Break the Rules. And in there, they talk about how you are front and centre as CEO. Like, you're the person that everyone's looking to for cues. Like, is the company in trouble? Is it doing well? So you're presenting literally every day to a company and to keep their trust and morale up. I wanted to ask you, because I assume that's pretty tough going uh, for anybody, you know, any kind of leadership position. But as CEO, you're steering that ship. And even when things are tough, you, you can't let it be seen. I want to ask you, what is the hidden cost of being that person? <laughs> and nobody wants to hear that, but it is mm. it's lonely. Like mm. It can be very, very lonely um, and very, uh, not just stressful, but like harsh on my life. Like it can be, there have been moments it has been very harsh like on my entire, uh, on my entire life. So yeah, it's, a very, it's a very expensive. But the thing, another thing that you're doing, because there's so many things you do with FFG, and one of the things that you do is, I know you host dinners with other um, leaders, and I think that's so critical, right? Because right. you said about the loneliness, and I think founders go through the same thing, obviously. When you get people together and you discuss, you know, issues, are you working, like, together? Like, do you go through, like, does somebody talk about the kind of issues they've had and then mm. you all kind of discuss what might be a, a suitable solution or is it just a camaraderie? Well, there, there's, there's comfort in group sharing and therapy, mm. right? So, so part of the reason it's lonely is because at that moment in time you feel, you know, you feel um, quite isolated and mm. I have a high sense of accountability. But when I think about myself just as a CEO and we're going through tough times, I actually never want to not express that this is difficult. And that has been an education for me as well. If the company's going through a difficult situation, I think we have to tell people that mm -hmm. we're in a difficult situation. And that comes back to the trust thing, right? Because inevitably there'll be pockets in the company that know that it's a tough time or suspect it's a tough time. So you lose credibility by grandstanding and behaving as though it's not a tough time. Equally, you are the leader, so people don't want to see you stood up there saying, okay, ship's sinking, you know, it's going to be perilous for all of us and grab, grab a life jacket if you can, right? Nobody wants that from you. Yeah. But if the ship is in trouble, mm. the best thing you can do is frame that in the right way that you get the right reaction. So I've kind of learned that over time. But then it comes to like the group share thing. And I host, I host those dinners so that we can talk about things that we don't talk to our investors or to our team about. Not that we don't, but that are uncomfortable for us mm. to be vulnerable upwards or downwards. I like to host those dinners. And one of the ones I held recently was Black History Month, which I don't like, by the way, but mm. we had a, you know, a set of um, black leaders, men, black men in leadership positions with really high profiles, highly accomplished, because there's an element of being you know, in that seat as a male black leader, top of an industry or at the, towards the top of an industry, that's quite unique and it's difficult to talk about. And suddenly around that table, you're hearing a group of guys who are all experiencing that, mm. expressing it in the same way. I mean, we had an hour's discussion on how the role of our fathers have caused us to perform as professionals. And it was just, 
amazing for me to listen to 10 different stories about the role of our fathers and what that has, what has, that has played. And sure, you know, not to, not to labour the point, but sure, for a lot of people, including a lot of men in leadership positions, our fathers played an important role in, in our lives. In the black community, the role of the father, which is mostly absent to some degree, it just has a different perspective on it. And not, not everybody grew up in a single parent mm. household around that table, but the majority did. And just contra contrasting that experience with those who didn't and talking about what that experience has done to us as men, I don't know another place I could have had that mm. conversation in that way, right? So that's why I like I like doing that. Yeah, I think that's what's so great about FFG is that you're, you kind of you know that you've got to a certain level in life, and you're obviously doing extremely well. I know that there's more to come, and I, I want to ask you about that. But when you're lifting other people up, and these are people that are highly accomplished themselves, right. but you lift them up in spirit as much as anything right. else. What's what do you all take away from it? So do you? Take, I guess, what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about you learn from going into other companies. I'm assuming you learn a lot from each other as leadership because you'll all be different yeah. in, in the roles that you have and the companies that you work at. Is it, I'm assuming, almost like a, an advisory board, like you could communicate with each other outside of the dinners? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's everything, Daniel, and that's why those groups are so important to me because it's a, it's a bit of everything. So if we take just that dinner as an example, right, there's a little bit of... Um, shared suffering so mm. you know what we're all dealing with at the moment that's a little bit difficult and a bit tough there's our personal situations and how are we managing those and a bit of um not encouragement but a bit of actually you know mm. if you if you're not seeing your kids that much and that's a problem for you mm. you need to do something about that right so mm. holding each other to a bit of a bit of an account and then the the other part i like is a little bit of performance grandstanding where there might be a few people around the table who have achieved something really meaningful since the last time we were together and you have a moment of celebrating that and then you have a moment of thinking okay you know by the time we get back around this table I need to have done I see, yeah. need to have done better which is I guess typical mm. male competitive yeah. but nonsense. it's great though because people always say if you surround yourself with people who are very aspirational it rubs off on you as Absolutely. well and yeah. that's you know a wonderful place to be because you know we all come from different backgrounds we all have different you know, upbringings, but when you're all together and you have shared experiences, then it's a, a way to kind of lift everybody up. Absolutely. And I know you're doing a female one. You're doing a women's dinner Absolutely. in the new year, which is great. I think you kind of take on each challenge that you do, like a mountain climb, I've heard that analogy. When are you going to be like satisfied? What's next for you? And do you ever think you're going to stop? I don't think it will ever be enough. Mm. Like, I, I don't think I'll ever be able to sit down and just, you know, <laughs> chill yeah. out until my phone. I don't know. I'm just not, I'm not built that way. I am dealing with my work addiction mm. at the moment. Like that is a thing I'm consciously How do you deal with it? trying to manage. I think it's a process uh, team. I'm now kind mm. of rebuilding the team around me at Fortera mm. and on the FFG side. Um, but no, I don't think I'll, I think I always need to be you know, in the ring, like in the arena. Mm. And I think the arena will change over time. God, I hope it does. Mm. Um, but I don't think I'll be able to stop. Fair enough. I don't think you will either. Um, in terms of arena, it just reminded me that I wanted to ask you about when you are working this hard, and I'm sure you have demands on your time from family. You know, you've got a wonderful family. You're stretched in many ways because you're doing the FFG. How do you find balance, which I know a lot of people hate that kind of question, but I assume get a lot of criticism. And there's that quote, that famous quote about the man in the arena. Mm. You are the person in the arena. You're the person that's doing it. You're the person that's not waiting for government to, to do these initiatives. What, how do you get balance or do you not get balance? I'm embarrassingly structured. And, I, and I've just had to work on make, making sure that that doesn't present as, you know, inauthentic, um, but mm. I'm incredibly structured. My Saturday mornings I, I spend with my children. Normally one of them's playing football, so I go do that. Sunday afternoons I spend with my family. It's a very sacred time when we have holiday time. I mean, it's scheduled. That, that's the part of it that's a little bit, I guess, distasteful. Like people watching this who think about their family as this 
yeah, organic, mm. fluid thing. But my, it means it happens, right? It so means that's, it happens. Yeah. yeah. No, nothing happens in my life that isn't a block in my calendar, mm. even you, sleep. Do you ever want to not have that block? Do you ever envisage, and I know you, you said you can't imagine kind of doing anything else, but do you foresee a time when you will like focus maybe solely on FFG? Or do you think you're just oh, yeah. going to be... Yeah, when I, when I say the arena will change, like it might be, you know, I want to get this charity, I want to start this charity and get it to this scale. It mm. might be, I want to be the manager of the under six, you know, Seven Oaks football team and see if we can get them to the Premier League. Like it will just be, mm. it will be something. Um, hopefully it won't always be as demanding a tech CEO role. I, I know mm. it won't be, but it will mm. always be something. And and my wife says to me that it it will be something. And, and it being the local under six football team is a good example because I would, it's the kind of thing I would take on mm. and decide that we're going to make this like a football league like, mm. team <laughs> in 10 years. Are you quite harsh on these kids? Like, come on, <laughs> we're going to yeah, do it. I'm not a passive parent at all. So, so you're obviously a perfectionist, which... As in, like you're saying about you have that structure and, you know, and when you go into companies, obviously you are like restructuring and again, there's this plan. How do you deal with no plan? Like, is there ever a time when something hasn't gone the way that you thought and how did you deal with it? I mean, obviously in your upbringing, and I guess maybe that's partly, do you think that's partly why you like structure? Yeah. I, I, the, the importance of the plan, I've had this conversation tons of times, the importance of the plan is not that everything goes according to plan. Like you do, you do this plan and the thing you are hoping for a little bit is that it goes according to plan. The thing you know is least likely is that everything goes according to plan. The importance of the plan is so that you know when something is going wrong as close to immediately as possible. Mm. And sometimes you realize it's going wrong and it's okay, right? It just, it's gonna take a little bit longer or things went against you, but it will be fine. And other times it's going, it's not going according to plan and you, you better do something about it. So the importance of the plan is just like that early indicator of where you know where we where we are. You know, we talked previously about Dwayne Jackson, who's a, a mutual connection. In the front of his book, he talks about this: if you don't have a plan, like if you there's a quote that basically if you don't have kind of your life planned out and you do, you're not in control of it, someone else will plan it for you. Right. And I think that's so true. Do you credit? some of your success to the fact that you had a plan I mean obviously not at the very beginning because you didn't know as mm -hmm. we discussed at 18 that you're going to become a CEO but once you are on that path of being a CEO do you plan like you know what you want the next role to be yeah I think me and Dwayne are quite similar we're, we're friends as you as you know and we talk often and our upbringings are different but but quite similar um, in a lot of ways and I think we come into this with a very low sense of entitlement a high expectation that we're going to have to work really hard to, you know, get anything done or or, um, or to achieve anything, and an openness to being helped and influenced and advised by you know by others because we know our education and our background hasn't set us up for this. Mm. So, you know, we better invite in uh, as much help uh, as we can get. But the other thing I think is similar is we've both lived our lives where external events largely external events have caused complete downward chaos in our in our personal lives so it makes you want to take as much control and as much ownership of your fortunes as as possible i think we we're very similar in that regard we talk mm. about that a lot mm. and so i i know you had a, a happy childhood i'm guessing that you wouldn't change anything in your life but if you could give advice to a younger dean what one piece of advice would you give him it's going to be fine. <laughs> that's, that's what I'd say to him. I'd say, it's going to be fine. I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change any of it. As a parent now, it's very hard to parent my children because I've been so deeply educated to, to achieve in order to not suffer. Mm. But my, and that is a motivator, right? I knew what it was like to be cold. I knew what it was like to, you know, live in one room with, with my siblings. So I have this, I don't want to live in that. I can, and if I had to, I would, but I don't want to. Mm. And that's a real driver for me. My kids don't have that. Mm. 
they have no idea what it's like to not have anything. Like they, they just, they think they do, but they don't. Mm, so no, it's, ve- it's very hard to create drive in them when the only source of drive for me was suffering. And that actually is a hard, mm. hard thing to do as a parent. Yeah, but the thing is you can't force drive. All you can do is get them to find their passion. And you know more than most that once you lock on to something, once you know what your passion is, you, the drive, you know, it just takes you along. Obviously you're in a unique it position, does. but... It does, I'm sure it does, but I'm being philosophical mm. when I say that because my drive was yeah. when I realized that there were jobs mm. that paid 50,000 pounds a mm. year. Like that blew my mind mm. that you could get, mm. like you could, you could get yeah. 50,000 pounds a year mm. for just going to work. My kids, my kids have a different understanding of what fifty yeah, thousand sure. pounds can be yeah. can be useful. So they so they will never throw themselves into something because mm. it feels like that for them. Yeah, we, we just we do have to find another reason. Yeah, but obviously I'm assuming there's a lot of gratitude because you have worked so hard. Like I know I've discussed with many people about luck and what part luck plays, and I think people overestimate how much luck plays in these things. It's obviously down to hard work. Being authentic, which is something you genuinely are, and that's how you build relationships. I just wanted to end it with basically saying that, you know, you're obviously an inspiration to so many. You've won so many awards. You know, like recently, number two on the power list. I mean, these are fantastic accolades. What would you say, A, is, you know, what what does it allow you to do, having those awards? Because I know it's not the award itself that kind of gives you a drive or a passion of, you know, it's not the awards that you're aiming for, but also like, what do you hope that others see by you winning the awards? There's uh, two parts to that, Daniel. Like I, I struggled a little bit with, you know, telling the story and being, being visible in this way, but two, two recent experiences, you know, one is I'm doing certain things um, with charitable causes that I care a lot about. And I've been able to, you know, kind of rally up a set of corporate partners, customers, um, people that I've done business with to engage in those charitable causes. And they're good people and I know they want to do good in the world. But I'm, I also know that their, um, you know, appetite and energy comes because I do have a platform now. Right? Mm-hmm. So now there's a lot of good energy going to causes that I care a lot about, which has been hugely helped by, by having, that, uh, having that platform. And even hiring, like making hiring decisions and getting good talent to come and participate with me, that platform definitely helps that. So that's kind of one good you know, output of the awards or the, the, I guess, recognition. The other is I, was, um, I went back to Catford not so long ago where, where I spent a lot of time growing up. And I was buying, some, I rode my bike there and I was buying some food in the, in the market I had my helmet on and my, my riding gear. And there was a young guy that served me. He said, oh, you're, you're, I've seen some of your interviews. Like, I've watched, I've watched you um, online, seen some of your interviews. It must have been like 18 or 19. And I said, oh, yeah, which ones did you watch? And he kind of pulled it up on his phone. He said, I watched this. And he started to say back to me some of the things I said yeah. in the interview. And then he called his dad, who was also working oh. on the store. And he was explaining to his dad that he'd seen me. And his dad was a bit confused. So then he showed his dad the interviews. And his dad kind of went, oh, I remember. Like, they obviously mm-hmm. had a moment at home mm. about it and then his dad who owned the store is like giving me the food oh, and telling me not to yes. pay for it because yeah. he's saying his son has got real motivation and energy now and I've mm. had some small role mm. in that right this is a kid where I'm from looks like me mm. you know sounds like me and some tiny element of his energy to mm. do well for himself mm. has come from from this isn't that amazing yeah and that like that blew my mind. I paid for the food, but that kind of blew, that blew my mind. Blew but my what's mind. brilliant about it is not only as you, you're inspiring him, but like you said, he'd obviously spoken to his dad. He'll talk to his friends. These are the role models yeah. that we all need. And I think the fact that you're visible, which I know isn't necessarily something that comes easy to you, it means that others can learn from you as well. Yeah, de- yeah de- definitely. Definitely. And I, I, you know, we... We have to think about what people see, mm. right? what, what people see, especially underrepresented and mm. underprivileged um, mm. people. We have to think about what they see. We can't just keep showing them, you know, negative stereotypes. 
and expecting positive from them mm. just to avoid the negative stereotypes. Mm. Like you can't keep showing somebody something mm. terrible and trying to motivate them by saying, don't be this. Mm. You have to show people something positive. Mm. And the thing I like most about the work sometimes we do back in that community is people can't bring me their excuses too. Right? So when people mm. say it's hard, it's difficult, mm. government doesn't help us, mm. I'm trapped here, I kind of go, yeah, 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 yeah. you are, you are. Mm. Let's go, it's game time. Mm. Right? I like, you know how you said earlier about reframing that, so, you know, telling these people, you are perfectly positioned to go and succeed. Right. You have absolutely what it takes. Because right. chances are, the media that we've talked about, traditional media, even schools, I mean, even sometimes parents, they yeah. don't necessarily instill that confidence that you can do it. Yeah. And you are the prime example. Yeah. You're amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Dean, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you.